good morning, Woodland Church. It is good to be with you today, and I wanted to wish you all a very Merry Christmas. I, I, I know it's already been a day, all right, but I, I was hoping for a little bit more, you know, pop in that. And, you know, there are a lot of places that it's not really customary anymore to say Merry Christmas. Church is not one of them, all right? So Merry Christmas, Woodland. Much better, much better. And, and for all of those of you who are kind of the planners, the A-types, you know, you're not just on time, you're early. I just wanted to give you a, a really good heads up. It is 364 days until the next Christmas, all right? All right? So you can kind of get everything together and keep calm. It's only 364 days till Christmas, all right? Now, today is, uh, is a fun day as we, you know, not only gather, you know, to celebrate after, after Christmas and the Christmas aftermath, but uh, it's also pajama day here. And, and when they announced that, I remember sitting there thinking, oh, this is going to be interesting. And somebody asked me, they said, hey, Pastor Ken, are you going to wear pajamas? And I'm like, absolutely, I am going to wear a pair of pajamas. Now, here's the thing. I, I'm, I'm not in the pajamas that I really wanted to wear this morning. What I really wanted to wear was the pajamas that Ralphie wears on a Christmas story. You know, that, that as a matter of fact, I, I, I had an image. I'm not sure if it's able to pop up or not. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that was like, somebody was like, oh, Ken, Pastor Ken, that would be great if you had a pair of those. And I'm like, I wish I did, but unfortunately, no, I do not. So digital Ken in those uh, pajamas are about the only thing you're going to see me in uh, wearing that. So uh, that's not happening today, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective. Uh, but it was a question, you know, are you going to wear pajamas? And, I, and, and here's the thing, I haven't really worn pajamas since I was probably eight or nine years old. And I can tell you, those don't fit anymore. And so I'm like, nope, not wearing those pajamas. The best I have are some pajama boxes. And so I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm going to show up at church like most of you have been showing up to work over the last year. You know, for those of you who've been working remotely, you know, when you set up for that Zoom call and it's all business on top and party down below. All right, you know, that's it. Business on top, comfy down below because that's the way a lot of you have been. And here's the thing. You will never see me. If you're on a Zoom call with me, you never have to say, I wonder if Pastor Ken is wearing pajamas or sweatpants, you know, underneath all that business apparel up top. I can tell you no, because I have seen enough of the viral videos of people who have to stand up in the middle of those calls and they forget to mute or, or kind of pause their video. And then next thing you know, you're getting way more of them than you bargained for. And, and here's the deal. You know, what is comfy to some people is very uncomfy for people who have to view it. And so, you know, and so I was just like, all right, I'll do this. And I was, you'll never see me in these kind of pajamas again because they also don't have pockets. I hate not having pockets. It drives me crazy. So pajamas, sweatpants are about the, you know, the comfy part of me. That's, that's where I get is down into the sweatpants. But I even wore my uh, slippers today, which felt like really weird driving here this morning, all right? Because I got about an hour drive to get over here. And I'm thinking if something happens to my car and I have to stand on the side of the road looking like this... <laughs> They are going to send me to the hospital, all right? That's what's going to happen because uh, this is just not normal. But, you know, I, I, I was excited to kind of say, all right, this is kind of the way it looks. And I was excited because I also get to wear these and I don't wear these in public. But, you know, for those of you who are sitting towards the front, you know, what theme are my pajama bottoms? Star Wars. Why am I wearing Star Wars pants? Because I am a Star Wars geek. I have been since I was a kid. As a matter of fact, our dog is named Chewbacca. All right. And if you don't know who Chewbacca is, I can't catch you up on 40 years of movie history. All right. So, you know, but his name is Chewbacca and my wife and I may or may not have on occasion dressed in Star Wars costumes. Like, every time we went to go see a Star Wars film. So, you know, that was just kind of, that's kind of our thing. As a matter of fact, it extends well beyond our wardrobes and costumes and things like that. We have Star Wars ornaments on our tree. All right, take a look. I mean, these have been collected over years. And I can tell you, this ain't all of them. All right, there are a bunch of them. And one of my favorite ones is, uh, we have this Darth Vader one that my wife got for me one Christmas and it actually plays a sound. So it plugs into the lights, it lights up and it plays a sound. And it's one of my favorite ornaments, but we also have another ornament that we got when we were you know, young, younger in our marriage and we, we bought this, we, oh yeah, I think we got as a gift, a Santa ornament. And the Santa ornament also plays a sound. 
And so every time we turn our lights on during Christmas, we are greeted with this sound. And I have to play it for you so you can hear it. Now, that's a weird thing to hear. You got the Christmas music playing in the background and you have Darth Vader threatening Luke Skywalker. I mean, it's just one of those like, what is going on here? But that's that's our tree. Our tree is this kind of hodgepodge. It's got ornaments from where we've traveled. It's got gift ornaments, memory ornaments, and then it's got these Star Wars ornaments on it. And it's a hodgepodge. But actually, I look at that tree and I say, but that's actually a good picture of Christmas because Christmas is different for every single one of us in this room. For some of us, we take it really seriously. I mean, we've got the lights, we've got the decorations, we've got the Christmas traditions, and they must happen, all right? It's going to happen. And then you have those who are just kind of unconventional about their Christmas. They they just kind of take it as it goes. You have people who are experiencing incredible joy this season. Then you have people who are experiencing some sorrow and challenges, And and that's what we bring to the Christmas season. It is a mixed bag. So I like our tree because it represents exactly what Christmas is. It's this mixed bag. Now, a little bit earlier, I said, you know, it's become customary in certain environments for people to drop the phrase Merry Christmas, right? As a matter of fact, it's been kind of a culture war that's been raging where people are, you know, saying, hey, don't take Jesus out of Christmas. I mean, you know, there's this this fight. And so you kind of have this banner that everybody kind of sits under, which is keep Christ in Christmas, right? That became the bumper sticker, the t-shirt, the phrase, because we don't want Christ removed from Christmas. We want him front and center in Christmas. And so there's a desire on the part of followers of Jesus to say, hey, we don't want to see that removed. Now, if somebody says happy holidays to me, I am not offended by that. Because even in happy holidays, you know where you get the term holiday? Holy day. They haven't removed God by saying holiday, all right? That, that hasn't happened. Now, if they say season greetings, okay. That's a little, bit, a little bit different. But I grew up in an area where half of the population was Jewish. And if somebody said to me, happy Hanukkah, I wasn't offended. That's because that's what they're celebrating. So I'm not interested in kind of picking sides on the, on the culture war when it comes to saying Merry Christmas. But here's the big challenge. The big challenge isn't keeping Christ in the words we say at Christmas time. The biggest challenge is actually living out a Christ-like life all the time. See, because the problem for most Christians isn't that we, you know, we struggle with saying Merry Christmas and keeping Christ in Christmas, the trouble from some Christians is that we contain Christ in Christmas. That that's where we isolate Jesus. Because if we are being honest, we really like baby Jesus. Because baby Jesus doesn't make any demands of us. Baby Jesus doesn't say anything uncomfortable. Baby Jesus doesn't challenge us. The only thing we need to do is we need to look at him, we need to love him, And that's good, but we don't have to listen to him and we don't have to obey him because he's just a baby. But here's the thing, that baby grew up. And the problem with most of us in keeping Christ in Christmas is that's where we leave him. We prefer the Christ in the cradle to the Christ on the cross. That we actually prefer the baby in the manger than the prophet on the mountainside. But here's the thing. Christ grew up. That little baby in a manger would one day be the prophet on the mountainside who would make some demands of us. And a baby, yes, the baby deserves our attention and our affection. But if that baby's a king, that king deserves our allegiance. And that's something more. And so my challenge for us today, as we go through the after Christmas, the Christmas aftermath, is for us to keep Christ after Christmas. That we keep Christ after Christmas. That we realize this isn't a seasonal devotion thing, but this is our lives that we give to Jesus. Because that baby that didn't make demands of us grew up. And in the, in the narratives about Jesus' birth, you, you find them in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 2, and Luke chapter 1, and Luke chapter 2. And in Luke chapter 2, we're given the birth story. We're given the, the night that Jesus was born, the angels show up, the shepherds come, 
and worship him. And then it goes on in that very chapter. Because we're given a summary. We're not given all of Jesus' childhood, but we're given a summary of the events that took place. Because here's the thing. The gospel writers wanted us to know that Jesus was fully God and fully man. That he was born. He didn't descend from the clouds to come and speak to us. He became one of us. So that's an important thing they want to get across. So that's why they spend some time telling us that. They also want to tell us that Mary and Joseph were faithful in bringing Jesus up as a good Jewish boy. And this is what we read in Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 22. This is after the time of Jesus' birth. It says, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn man, male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. There was a sacrifice that you had to, be, to kind, of, you know, kind of get past kind of the unclean stage of having a child in their religious system. So after 40 days, Joseph and Mary go to Jerusalem to dedicate Jesus because the law required it. Now, we know that this is before the visit of the Magi, and there's a reason we know that. The reason we know that is because when it says what they gave as an offering, they gave the poor person's offering. Because the law said you are to sacrifice a spotless lamb for a child, for the firstborn son. But that was an expensive sacrifice. Mary and Joseph didn't have that kind of money. Well, God allowed in his law to say, if you cannot afford a lamb, then you can sacrifice two birds. And that's the offering that Mary and Joseph give. That tells us they don't have gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They don't have that kind of money. And so they are offering what they can. They're still in the region of Jerusalem living in Bethlehem. Now, we are given kind of a story of that dedication. And on their way, they run into two different people, a woman and a man who both prophesy about the life of Jesus as being the Messiah. Then the gospel writer takes a leap. We've gone from the birth 40 days later, and now all of a sudden he moves over a decade later. And we read these words. Well, actually, no, before we jump there, there's kind of a conclusion to that segment after the dedication of Jesus. In Luke chapter 22, it says, it says, when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. This is important. That baby grew up and started to grow in wisdom and in the favor of God. Now we jump forward over a decade and we're still in the same chapter. Luke chapter two, starting with verse 41, it says, every year Jesus's parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. All right. Now, I, I read that passage and I thought, that sounds like a 12-year-old boy, right? That's a 12-year-old. I mean, you know, in, in the Jewish culture, he was, he was on the verge of becoming a man in their culture. And so what he's beginning to do is he's beginning to kind of assert his own authority, his independence. That sounds like a 12-year-old to me. They're, they're testing it out. So Jesus stays back. That sounds like a 12-year-old. I love what it says next. It says, thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day without him. That sounds like the parent of a 12-year-old, right? I mean, it's just kind of like if they're not making noise and they're not causing trouble, they're good. And so they kind of travel on and they go an entire day. And I imagine it's when they began to settle camp for the night that they were like, whoa, where's Jesus? We're told this, then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, important little number there in the Bible. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed 
at his understanding and his answers. Now, here's the thing you have to understand about the way that Jewish boys were taught and trained. There were certain schools where they were learning the scriptures. By a young age, they would have the first five books of the New Testament memorized. I mean, this was a very, very devout culture. And as they got older, they would move into different schools of training. Well, around 12 years old, they would enter a school of training that was asking questions. That's what they were taught to do. And so if you were to ask somebody a question, they would actually answer you with a question. This is what you see in the life of Jesus all the time. People ask him a question and he answers them with a question. It's, it's, it's like training. If it was a math question, it would be like, okay, what's five plus five? And the student would answer, what's 20 divided by two? And some of you are like, really, Ken? Chris, it was just Christmas yesterday. Do we need to do math on Sunday? Right. But that was the idea. It was this question responding with a question. That's what Jesus is doing in the temple at 12 years old. He is asking questions. And it says that they were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now, now this is a unique 12 year old because honestly, I'm sure Mary and Joseph were looking for Jesus and did not expect to find him at church. Didn't find, expect to find him at the temple. If my kid ran away, I couldn't find him for three days. Church is probably not the place I think he's gonna be. But that's where Jesus was. And we're told this, when his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have, be, have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was trying to say to them. All right, now, now for some of you, you might have grown up with a little different translation. And both of them are valid because... In my father's house, that, that, that term house is actually not in the original language. It's used to help us understand the phrase here. Another way to translate that is, I have to be about my father's business. Because if you're a part of your father's household, you're doing your father's business. So Jesus says, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I have to be about what God's called me to do? Like, yes, I have an earthly mother and father, but I have a heavenly father. And I'm doing what he's requiring. Now, like I said, Jesus wasn't quite a man just yet in their culture. And so we're told this, then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Does that, does that last verse sound familiar? It, it should sound familiar because we just read a, a, a verse just a little bit earlier that has that same formula. And you have to understand, anytime you read in the Bible and something repeats itself, that's to get our attention. It's to tell us something. And so if you look at verse 40 and verse 52, they are saying similar things. Verse 40 says, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. Verse 52, and Jesus, not the child, he's a boy, grew in wisdom and stature. He grew in strength and wisdom. That's exactly what we learn in verse 40. And in favor with God. That's also what we learn in verse 40. So what's different between these two verses? There's one thing that's different. And it's meant to get our attention. Because what does it say about Jesus? It says, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. There's the difference. Now, all of a sudden, this thing is going to change. Jesus is about his father's business. And that means not just honoring God and glorifying God, but Jesus is also going to reach out to humanity. That Jesus always maintained in his ministry and in his work, he always maintained this vertical relationship with God. But he also prioritized the horizontal relationship with others. You see this time and time again. That is what the cross is. It's got this vertical relationship with God and it's got this horizontal relationship with humanity. That's why Jesus, when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? How did he respond? He did not say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and stop there, did he? That's critical. That's a priority. Oh, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you think you're doing one and you're not doing the other, you're doing neither. 
If all you're doing is loving your neighbors, you're not loving God. If all you're doing is loving God and you don't care about your neighbors, you're not loving God the way you should. Jesus says, no, there's a, there's a both and here. Love God and love others. Now, here's the thing. When it comes to loving God, even if we look at ourselves and evaluate ourselves you know, accurately, we know we're not perfect in our love of God and our devotion to God. We always know there's room for us to grow in what we know, room to grow in our obedience, all of those things. But we get the concept of loving God, and honestly, loving God becomes an easier thing for us to try to do. That's a desire in our hearts to love God. Where it becomes challenging is actually loving our neighbors, right? I mean, we can have the loving God thing down. But we're like, Ken, have you met my neighbor? Have you met my coworker? Have you met my family member? Like, that's when loving God becomes the easy thing. But that's not what Jesus calls us to do. Because this baby Jesus grew up and said, not only do you have to love me, you have to learn from me. And I came to love God and love others. And I'm expecting you, expecting you, commanding you to do the same. See, when we gather for worship on a Sunday morning, yes, we are coming to love on God. But we're also coming to learn from him. Followers of Jesus come to get a message so that we go out and live the message. That's why we're here. We come to get a message so that we go out and live a message. I always used to say to my congregation, I said, the best Sunday sermon is the one that impacts the life of a person who was never there. Because it impacted the life of a person who was, who took that message out and lived it out. You want to make your pastor happy? Go and live the message on Monday, not just listen to it on Sunday. It makes the biggest difference. And, and here's the thing, you know, as we close this Christmas season and we have a desire to keep Christ after Christmas, well, then we're going to need a wardrobe to do that. Like today, for some of us, we're, we're here in pajamas. This is not what we're going to be wearing the rest of the week, is it? The weather's going to demand different clothes. Our jobs are going to demand different clothes. School may require different clothing. I mean, we are going to change. We are going to dress for the occasions, dress for the environments. Well, here's what I love. I love the fact that we are given Christmas clothes to wear all year long. Because with Christ, we now have somebody we can follow, not just a book to tell us how to behave, but a person to look and say, that's what it looks like to love God and love others. And so as you go into this new year, I want to challenge you to put on the right clothes. That I want to challenge you that as you consider, all right, so how do I live out this life of Jesus in my daily life? Well, fortunately, we're given instructions on how to do that. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church in Colossa, we call it the book of Colossians. He talks to them about the fact that they are, if they're followers of Jesus and they've been baptized in his name, they've literally been buried and resurrected. That's what baptism is, a symbol of burial and resurrection. And he's like, and now you've got a new life and that new life requires new clothes. Kids, any of you out there get clothes for Christmas? Anybody get clothes? Did you, did you act excited about it? Right? Because <laughs> that was the thing. You know, if I grabbed a package and it rattled and clunked, I was excited about that. If I grabbed a package and it just went fluff, 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 I'm like, that's a shirt, that's a sweater, that's pants or socks or something. You know, and I never was super excited about getting clothes. But I can tell you, in Christ, we're offered a set of clothing we're going to want to wear. The Apostle Paul goes into it this way. He starts in Colossians chapter 3, starting with verse 1. He says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. All right, so you've got this new life. You died to the old ways. Now you're starting something new. And he goes in and says, all right, so this is what you need to take off. 
This is the wardrobe you were wearing, and this is what needs to be removed. He says this, he uses this really strong language. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now, but now that you have a new life, you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with the practices, with its practices, and have put on the new self. So there are some things we need to remove. We can't put on the new clothes if we're keeping the old clothes on. And those old clothes include some pretty difficult things. Rage, anger. Rage and anger, that's just you not getting your way. Malice, that's you demeaning somebody. Slander, that's putting somebody else down and lifting yourself up. I mean, there are some things here. Don't lie to each other. Don't use filthy language. These are important things. And for some of us, those are the things like we're looking at it going, okay, I got some work to do this coming year. To put on some new clothes, I got to take off some old clothes. But here's the thing. The apostle Paul goes on and he says, you've put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. In other words, all of us are equal here. All of us have some work to do. All of us have some things to leave aside and to put off and put to death. But it's one thing to have kind of the things we need to remove. What are we supposed to put on? The Apostle Paul gives us our wardrobe. He gives us our Christmas clothes that we wear all year long because he says this, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I mean, there's quite a list here. For some of us, we thought, oh man, I'm going to have trouble kind of letting go of some of the bad things. I can tell you right now, you'll have a lot more trouble putting these things on. Because these demand some things from us. And the list is pretty clear. That we're to clothe ourselves with compassion. That means looking towards others' needs first. That we are to actually put on kindness. That doesn't mean we feel kindness. It means we act kindly. There's a difference. And sometimes the action needs to come first before the feeling ever comes. But we choose to be kind and that shouldn't surprise us. We're told in the scriptures, it's, it isn't God's wrath that leads us to repentance. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. We're also to put on humility. That's not thinking less of yourself, just less often of yourself and yourself alone. Then there's gentleness. That's power under control. Patience. Oh, boy, do we need patience. But I can tell you right now, one of the biggest things we need is that forbearance. That, that idea that I'm not only going to be patient, I'm going to be patient with this person right here. I'm going to forbear. I'm going to put up with. I'm going to tolerate. And here's the thing. In our culture, we are losing this quickly. We are so easily and quickly offended by everything. Because we are losing the forbearance part of our clothing. And the next part comes in handy too. <laughs> what are we asked to do? We're asked to forgive as the Lord forgave us. That's why it's so important to know that Jesus is your savior and your forgiver because it equips you to forgive those who do things against you. And I love how he wraps it all up because he says, and the one that ties it all together 
is love. Love that says, I'm going to put you ahead of me. It's a disposition. It is a, you're going to be the object of my affection. These are the clothes that we're asked to put on. And so as we move into the new year, I want to challenge you to consider how do you put these clothes on? How do you keep Christ after Christmas? How do you keep Christ in you as a Christian? That's putting on your Christmas clothes. That's dressing yourself the way that Jesus taught us to and live this way. Now, kids, I have another question for you. Kids, how, how many of you, I know you shouted out your favorite toy or whatever. How many of you, you know, got some of those things that you wanted for Christmas that were on your list? How many of you got what you wanted on your list? Oh, good. Look at that. So many hands. That's awesome. All right. So next year, you won't have to make a list, right? You got everything you need this year, right? You're, you're good. You don't, you don't need anything more. And some of you are sitting there going, man, who is this guy? Get him off the platform, all right? You know, because we know next year our list is going to change. Why? Because we are wanters by nature. We're not havers, we're wanters. And we look past what we have and we look at, towards what we want. I, want. I want to challenge you today to think about, all right, so what do I really want in the coming year? Now, we're actually going to launch a series starting next Sunday that's going to deal with this very issue. It's called the want cycle. And we're going to deal with this. And say, all right, what do we really want? But here's the thing, as, as a pastor, as a teacher here at Woodland, here's what I want. Here's what I want for you, and here's what I want for Woodland in 2022. I want it to be a year of loving God and loving others. I want, I want it to be a year where we keep Christ all year long. Where we keep Christ after Christmas. And we allow that grown-up Jesus to make some demands of us when it comes to how we love God and how we love others.